Hello, this is Chris Safarova. Today we have with us Stephen Cohen. Stephen is the Senior Vice Dean of Columbia University School of Professional Studies, among many other amazing roles that Stephen holds. And um, I'm so glad to welcome you, Steve, today. Thank you for having me. Steve, so to start with, maybe you could give us some context on how you ended up doing this work. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your career, maybe even starting with earlier years and how your life unfolded for you to dedicate it to this important topic of sustainability. Well, I mean, I started my professional career at the Environmental Protection Agency uh, in 1977, working in the water program. Uh, EPA was seven years old then. Uh, the Water Act was five years old. And I worked in that program. I worked in the toxic waste program, and leaking underground storage tanks. Uh, and then I went, came to Columbia University uh, to teach public management and general management. And so my two fields of study have always been environmental policy and management. And what I discovered as we got into the 21st century is those two fields started to merge. Uh, that, in fact, uh, on a more crowded planet, uh, in a global economy, uh, it became more important to start factoring into basic management decisions of factors related to the environment. That is very true. And I was wondering, do you also have a personal reason why you decided to do this work? Well, when, when I was in graduate school, uh, the there was a toxic waste uh, disaster in a place called the Love Canal, which was uh, very close to where I was in school. I, that was in Niagara Falls. I went to graduate school in Buffalo. Uh, and also I was very interested in uh, you know, the development of sustainable cities. Uh, the uh, I grew up in New York City. Uh, in the 1970s, the city seemed to be collapsing. Uh, and yet I saw there was a need to uh, revitalize cities uh, for both uh, economic reasons and for environmental reasons. And in fact, uh, one of the things that I've studied uh, and paid attention to through my career is the evolution of cities like New York. New York City started uh, as a trading city. Uh, we, we built the Erie Canal to get uh, farm produce from upstate New York and the Midwest and build the Port of New York. And then in the 19th century, we became a manufacturing city. In fact, at the end of World War II, 95% of the clothing worn in America was made in the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, and then our manufacturing collapsed. And it collapsed because of the development of containerized shipping and because our ports were too small and we were a vertical city, not horizontal. And so, in fact, what starts to happen is we lose a million uh, manufacturing jobs, but they very quickly over the 80s and 90s got replaced by a whole range of service jobs. And in fact, uh, the American economy during that period of time was transitioning from a manufacturing economy to a service economy. 80% of the American GDP is in uh, services. And so we're now in the process, I believe, of evolving toward uh, sustainability. Uh, we are in the process of developing a renewable resource-based economy. And just as we didn't recognize the move from manufacturing to service, uh, many people don't recognize that, in fact, what we sometimes call ESG, are in fact management principles uh, for the middle part of the 21st century as our organizations become more sophisticated and in fact, uh, more brain-based. The way I put it is we are in the brain-based economy now and we've evolved from a brawn-based economy of manufacturing to a brain-based economy with automation, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, more and more leaving to human beings, creative and analytic work. And I think that that is an evolution of management that sustainability is very much a part of. Stephen, and I was wondering, I think that we need to maybe just go a little bit deep into the topic and bring it more to practical things that people can do in their daily lives. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can start with that and then we can talk about what people can do within the organizations because many of our listeners, they are heads of divisions, they are heads of uh, a country, for example, or they have a team that they're responsible for. So they can have certain level of impact, often quite big level of impact. So let's start from 
let's start at home. Let's start with what people can do to actually reduce the environmental negative impact. Well, I, I think more and more people are paying attention to this. Uh, and uh, again, it's a kind of stage of development. When uh, you no longer have to worry about food, clothing, and shelter, you start to think about wellness. You start to think about physical fitness. And you start to think about uh, what is the environment that I am breathing and I'm drinking? What's, what's in the foods? What's in the ocean? What's in the air? Uh, New York City uh, last week was underneath a cloud uh, from forest fires from Canada. And so uh, everybody in the city was indoors and thinking about you know, what's happening to our world. And so I think to a very considerable extent, uh, we've now internalized that the environment is not just something pretty that we look at and we think, oh, how nice it is, there's a forest. It actually has to do with our wellness and our health. And so that's a transition that took place over the last half century as the environment has evolved from being an aesthetics issue and a conservation issue to an issue of basic public health and survival. And so in your daily life, everybody thinks about it. Uh, you don't think about it uh, in a deep and profound way. If you think about it, you know, you might separate your garbage. You might uh, decide uh, that you want a car that has uh, better gas mileage. Not so much because you're uh, uh, because of the environmental issues, but because it saves you money. Uh, and also, you start thinking about uh, you know how do I have a lower impact on the planet itself. Stephen, and what are some of the things that you have as uh, rules in your household in terms of in how my, you guys protect the environment? Well, one of the problems, you, I live in New York City and I live in an apartment building that was built in 1910. Uh, and when the city went to rate the energy efficiency of our building, we got a D. So there's very little I can do in my own apartment um, you know, that uh, I'm in control of. And so I, I think that's one of the things that people have to face. We have systemic issues, infrastructure issues uh, that can't be addressed by individuals alone. They require institutional change and political change. And I think we're seeing the beginnings of that right now. Yes, that is very true. So now let's think about what people can do in the work environment. Mm -hmm in terms of practical things they can do on Monday morning differently from what they're doing now? Yeah, well, I, I think there are a range of things that uh, organizations are starting to do. Uh, one of the sort of the low hanging fruit is energy efficiency. Uh, in here in the United States, we waste enormous amounts of energy just in our daily lives. So I'll give you an example. If you go to a hotel in Europe, uh, there's a timer on the lights in the hallway. Uh, when you go to your hotel room, you put your key in and the electricity comes on. Uh, in American hotels, we keep the lights on whether we're in the room or not. Uh, and it's just that's just an example of waste. Uh, so we uh, in our organizations, we should be thinking about energy efficiency. Uh, we should also be thinking about uh, our waste and where it's going uh, and whether it's retaining any of its economic value. Uh, in New York City today, uh, we're in the process of, of enacting food recycling laws. And the reason for that is when you uh, throw out food, and we do a lot of that again in, in, in America, uh, it retains value because it can be recycled into fertilizer and into energy. And so rather than dumping it into a landfill, you want to make sure that it's going to a place where it continues to have economic value. So those are just a couple of examples of things on the environment side. But the other, the other piece is uh, you know, when you think about organizational life and uh, the value of diversity uh, in the organizational workplace, you know, people think about this as woke management or some kind of an ideological thing. But if you think about it this way, um, we are in a global economy and we're in a brain-based economy. And that means that the companies and organizations that can bring to their organizational life the smartest and most talented people are going to win. They're going to win in that competition. But if my organization 
is biased against women or immigrants or minorities or people's sexual preference or anything other than how talented they are, uh, then I'm eliminating from my talent pool people that I want. And if I get a reputation for that, then I'm eliminating whole groups of people I should be trying to recruit. And so, and then if it, within the organization, the opportunity structure doesn't uh, isn't equal for all of the participants based on their merit, uh, then those people will leave and go to other organizations. And so if you think about our, econ our economy is now more creative and more analytic and more brain-based, uh, that competition for brain power, if I can compete through the whole world to get people to come to work for me, I'm going to be a much more competitive and effective organization. And the top organizations in the world understand this. That's, uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, some of these biases are slowly leaving the workplace. That is very true. As we're trying to transition to this less polluting, renewable, resource-based economy, let's talk about extended producer responsibility. I think it's an important thing for people to know what it is and what it involves. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, th this is really, uh, let's say that I have Apple computer and I sell you an iPhone. Um, then the question is, as that phone is no longer useful, what happens to it? Uh, in the old days, you put it in a drawer and you forget about it, or maybe it becomes part of electronic waste. Um, you throw it in the garbage and it ends up in the landfill. But in fact, that phone has rare earth metals and other valuable minerals in it. Uh, and more and more companies are saying, we'll give you $100 for that phone toward your next phone. And so this is, in essence, the concept of extended producer responsibility to say that you're, when you make something, you're not just responsible for selling it and then you forget about it. You're responsible for collecting it at the end of its useful life cycle. Now, what I would say about this is that isn't just charity. That isn't just, you know, being idealistic. It's actually being smart. Because you know these resources uh, are becoming more and more valuable, and one of the things that we're going to see eventually, and I write about this in my in my new book on environmental sustainability, is that the waste stream itself contains enormous mineral and resource value that right now we just throw into a landfill or we burn. Uh, I think what's what's going to start to happen is through the use of artificial intelligence and robotics, we're going to be mining our garbage for resources uh, because that will be less expensive than mining the planet. And so you pull your copper, your aluminum, your rare earth metals, and your nitrogen and other fertilizer material out of the waste stream. And that waste stream is no longer waste, but it's a resource stream. And so you can actually pay for the cost of disposal uh, by reselling uh, those those minerals and those uh, substances that are in the waste stream. And I think through technology, we're starting to see the beginning of this right now. Stephen, and what we're seeing happening now with adoption of this kind of mindset by different manufacturers and companies? Well, I mean, I think part of what you're seeing, particularly in the, in the United States and Europe and Japan and to some extent in China, um, is that uh, the the real growth opportunities are what's in what we call the green economy. So billions of dollars are being invested in electric vehicles, in batteries, in solar cells, in windmills. And uh, we're in the process, uh, although it's taking a while, we're going to turn our electric grid into a much more efficient mechanism for distributing electricity. And one of the problems with the electrical grid is when you manufacture and produce electricity, if it doesn't get used, it just gets wasted. And so we, through the use of uh, uh, projections and models, we can actually reduce the amount of electricity we're generating to match the amount we're going to use. Now, right now, uh, utilities produce much more electricity than is used. And so the reason for that is you don't want to run out. But if you use a uh, better analysis, you can then figure out ways of saving that from the very outset. All of these technological changes, the precision, the use of, of uh, data collection and data analysis and communication, which is far cheaper than it used to be. I mean, you know, 50 years ago, computers, you know, the computers that I used when I was in graduate school was the size of my kitchen and had less 
power, computing power than my iPhone has. And so we're starting to see the use of far more advanced analytics in, in every aspect of manufacturing. And what's particularly exciting is we're starting to see it in farming. And what that means is there'll be less waste of water, fertilizer, pesticides. And instead of all of those materials leaching into the environment, they get used by the plant, farmer saves money, food becomes less expensive, and the environment becomes more protected. Steve, let's now talk about the main stages of the transition to a renewable resource-based economy. I think it will be important uh, framework for people to have in their mind, okay, what are the stages and where we are at each stage, because some of them are happening simultaneously. Yeah. Well, first, I think there's a lot of things going on in the private sector without any government discussion or involvement. Uh, good examples of that, a good example of that would be Walmart, which is the largest retailer uh, in the United States. So Walmart is the fastest growing user of solar power of any commercial entity in the world. And the reason for that, uh, first, they have a lot of roofs uh, on their buildings and they're not being used. So they don't have to pay for any land and they use a lot of electricity in their stores and they have a tremendous amount of capital. And so you can recover the cost of a solar array in a commercial enterprise in less than 10 years. And so they're uh, going to renewable energy, not because they're you know, wildly concerned about climate change, although I think they are uh, concerned about it. It's just going to save them enormous amounts of money. Walmart's customers are price and value shoppers. And so they anything Walmart can do to reduce the cost of operating gets right into a combination of what the customer pays and what they make in profit. And they've been doing this for a long time, not just for solar energy. They require their suppliers to demonstrate uh, that they're adhering to a whole set of sustainability principles because Walmart figured out over a decade ago that environmental pollution is waste and waste is the opposite of efficiency. So one of the one of the things they've been doing for many years is they don't sell any kind of laundry detergent unless it's concentrated. But why is that? Because they don't want to pay to ship water and they don't want to put water on their shelves. They'd rather have just the concentrated detergent because Walmart in essence is making its profit by how much value can they put in every square foot. And if they're wasting square footage on water in laundry detergent, that, that's shelf space that could be used to make money doing something else. So companies, first of all, are looking at their own operations to see, you know, how do we use these green principles to not just reduce pollution, but to save money and to be more cost effective. Same thing with waste reduction and recycling. If I can actually be paid uh, something for the garbage that my organization is producing, or if I can figure out ways of closing the cycle of production so that nothing in my factory gets dumped into the environment and that I recover everything to use again, then the potential is there for higher profits. So that's the private sector side. But to do some of these things, we need public sector investment. Uh, we need infrastructure. Uh, you know, eventually the, we're going to have in the United States charging stations, uh, you know, outside of many retail stores. In fact, again, Walmart is putting in charging stations uh, in their parking lots. And they're doing it because they figure if you've got to take a half hour to charge your vehicle, you're going to go inside the store and buy some of our stuff. And so the profit motive is part of it. But then there are certain places where you need government intervention. So if you live in New York City and you want to have an electric vehicle and you don't own a garage, uh, you don't even have a driveway, then you're going to need public charging stations. So there's money in uh, the federal Inflation Reduction Act and Infrastructure Act to build that. Uh, also, as the utilities move to smart grids and to microgrids, computer controlled electrical generation, some of that, all of that will eventually be paid for by the users of electricity, but some of the capital costs have to be subsidized by the government because it's not in the interest of the utility to invest money in something that won't have a, an immediate payoff. So you need government intervention as well. There is this ideological idea that somehow there's a free market and then there's the government, the two things don't engage each other. Complete and utter nonsense. Uh, government has always been involved in the economy. Um, you know, 
Henry Ford invented the Model T, the first mass commercial uh, motor vehicle, but he didn't build any roads. The government built the roads. If the government hadn't built the roads, nobody would have bought any Model Ts. And so the idea that somehow you have the government not involved in the economy is completely ridiculous. And so uh, government has been building ports and other kind and, and trains and other kinds of infrastructure since the beginning of the industrial age. It's just a question of how much intervention there'll be and what shape it will take. But the idea that it doesn't exist is completely ridiculous. Yes, government is there to provide services and products and so on that private sector cannot or will not provide. So it right. has to be in play. Right. I think that it probably is a good place to start to talk about environmental degradation. Because I think mm -hmm. that, yes, we kind of all understand the importance of protecting the environment, protecting our planet. But because we don't see the extent of the damage, we don't understand the, sen the sense of urgency that we should have. Yeah, well, I think there are two kinds of environmental damage. There is, in fact, the kind you can see. So uh, the air in the United States uh, today is much cleaner than it was when the Clean Air Act was passed in 1970. Uh, in the late 60s and through the 1970s, uh, if you were in downtown Los Angeles, you couldn't see the mountains because of smog. Well, there is there is much less air pollution uh, in Los Angeles and throughout the United States because we did two things. We made automobiles less polluting with the use of catalytic converters, and we put stack scrubbers on our electric utility plants. And so you have that kind of pollution or water pollution where we build sewage treatment plants. But then there's pollution that is out of our uh, direct line of vision. Climate change is the best example uh, because climate change is created everywhere in the world. We have one biosphere uh, and a lot of its impact you don't see immediately. We're starting to see that add up. The climate models that we built here at Columbia University and other universities at the beginning of the 20th century all predicted that by 2020, some of the things we're seeing would be, were happening. Uh, more extreme weather, more frequent fire, uh, forest fires, uh, all of these things uh, were predicted and now they're happening. Uh, many people don't, don't connect the two to each other. Uh, I mean, for example, you go to a place like East Palestine, Ohio, uh, they know because of the derailment and the explosion that they were exposed to toxic chemicals. So that was easy for everybody to see and to understand. And in fact, resulted in the Democratic and Republican senators from Ohio proposing a new regulations on, on rail safety uh, because it was an obvious impact. Climate change is a little more subtle. The loss of biodiversity in places like the Amazon, uh, which where many people never get to see it, uh, those kinds of, uh, of that kind of damage is is more difficult uh, to understand and control. But I think if you can understand and see the local visible pollution, that often opens you up to the idea that there are other issues that you should be paying attention to. And in fact, in almost all the polling data that I look at, uh, younger people. Uh, are far more uh, concerned about the, the environmental uh, degradation than older people uh, because they've seen it their whole lives. Yes, that is very true. So what do you think we can do to have more of a sense of urgency? Uh, I think part of it is we have to stop panicking and we have to start getting uh, more uh, task oriented and focused on uh, positive and creative solutions. And, and so one of the things that I often say, and this actually follows the basic management principle that Deming uh, invented with TQM, instead of setting targets, you know, let's get this much reduction by 2050 and this much by, you know, let's rigorously analyze the current situation. How much pollution is there? What damage is being created? And what can we do to make things better as opposed to just shoot for an arbitrary target. And so a lot of that is starting to happen. Uh, we are starting to see uh, you know, people who are involved, for example, in building uh, construction. Uh, many of our developers in America are building homes that are more energy efficient, uh, that use renewable energy, 
that have heat pumps and do other things uh, to reduce their impact on the planet. This is becoming part of how people are thinking about their world, and it's becoming a design parameter. And we've seen this before. You know, uh, during the early part of the 21st century, uh, we started to put on air conditioners and refrigerators regulations on energy use. And we asked the manufacturers to produce more energy efficient uh, air conditioners and refrigerators. And so you go to the store and you'll see the annual cost of operating that refrigerator over the course of the year. And so suddenly engineers are thinking, how do I make this air conditioner produce the same cool air, but use less electricity? And so a modern air conditioner uses 75% less electricity than an air conditioner used 25 years ago, because the engineers have been thinking about it and have been working slowly on improving those situations. And that's the kind of you know, positive and kind of can-do attitude that we've often seen uh, you know, with, uh, with industry. And I think we're, we're starting to see that on a whole range of environmental issues. And this brings us to your view that all competent managers must be sustainability managers. Right. So it, it, the way I look at it sometimes is uh, the, the crash, the, the, the stock market crash of the 1920s was caused because we didn't regulate publicly traded companies. There was no Securities and Exchange Commission. So every company reported what they wanted to report. And if you invested money in the stock market, it was like going to a casino. You really had no idea what you were about to buy. So Franklin Roosevelt becomes president. He appoints Joseph Kennedy, who's John Kennedy's father, John F. Kennedy, the president's father, who was a, a very well-known speculator, uh, to be the first head of the SEC. And they developed rules which were largely accounting rules. So if you wanted to have access to the public marketplace to, to raise capital, you had to have audited reports by competent financial accountants who themselves were regulated by, uh, the, by the government. And so we developed the field of accounting in the 1930s. Later on, we added to accounting uh, information management. So performance measurement starts to grow. The, at the beginning of the 21st century, you see international desks starting in corporations and the, with the growth of the global economy. Uh, now, of course, every desk is an international desk. So now what's happening inside organizations is these issues of sustainability. Now, sustainability, I divide into several subfields. So my field is environmental sustainability, which is the use of energy, resources, and the management of waste and pollution. And so there, the idea is to have as light an environmental profile as possible. But several other subfields in sustainability management have emerged over the last decade. Uh, this is where ESG comes in. This is where some of the politicians are worried about woke capitalism and all that, but it's not. What it is, these are basic principles, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what, that's what I was talking about before. You try to make sure that your opportunity structure is open to the widest possible group of people because you want to get the best talent. And then other issues related to corporate management. So the, the boards and board processes need to be transparent so shareholders understand it. And in fact, investors want to know, uh, is this organization competently run? Uh, and so you're starting to see more and more investors concerned about what they call ESG. Uh, what is the environmental impact of this organization? Uh, and also, what is the community impact? In other words, when this organization sets up, uh, what's their relationship with their neighbors? Are their neighbors going to, at some point, uh, turn negative on the company? So a company like Amazon tried to locate their uh, headquarters too uh, in New York City. They asked the for, they asked for three billion dollars from the state and the city, and our local communities went nuts. They said, "What? Why are we giving this rich company three billion dollars to set up offices?" So they went to Crystal City instead. Uh, and they still ended up bringing twenty thousand workers to New York City, but not in a big headquarters. So community impact is something you have to pay attention to, and. In the public marketplace, investors are looking at all of these factors as they as they invest their funds because they want to really make sure 
that the risk is well managed. And environmental risk itself is a major risk. So the Securities and Exchange, and Exchange Commission uh, sometime in August is going to issue its first set of rules on carbon disclosure. And this is really a, the beginnings of measuring the environmental impact of the organization. Just as in the 1930s, uh, to get access to the marketplace, you needed accounting. In the 2030s, you're going to need a measure of financial uh, of environmental impact as well, because those create risks that investors want to understand. Stephen, and let's say someone is listening now and says, look, I agree with you, it's very important, but I don't even have time to sleep properly or see my children. I have performance evaluation coming up and no one is looking at what you guys are talking about here in this mm -hmm. session. What would you say to that? Well, it, well, you know, in the 1930s, we didn't have chief financial officers and organizations yet. Though That whole part of the organization developed. Until the 1980s, we didn't have chief information officers. In other words, this is a new part of a sophisticated organization that has to be built. So I direct a few master's programs here at Columbia. I have thousands of graduates. They're all out in organizations doing this right now. Uh, so the best managed organizations in the world, you know, the Walmarts and the Apples, I mean, Apple's a good example. Uh, they understand that their market uh, requires, these people that buy their computers and phones care about the toxicity of what they're buying. So Apple computers are far less toxic than they were 15 years ago. Uh, the head of environment uh, at Apple used to run the Environmental Protection Agency. And she's very uh, she's very influential on the, on the organization's design of new products. So what I'd say to people who think that, you know, people think of this as a frill, something outside of regular management. And what I'm saying is no, this is actually central. This is part of the definition of your organization. And, and you know, I teach a course just called sustainability management. And it used to be I had a hard time finding case studies. Look at the Harvard Business School's case study list for this year. And there are scores of sustainability case studies from all over the world. And, and this is becoming a fundamental management principle that many, many organizations are adopting. And frankly, the ones that don't are going to lose. They're not going to be able to compete because they're basically using early 21st century management techniques as we move into the middle of the 21st century. That is very true. And understanding the importance of these issues gives you also an opportunity to contribute to your organization if your organization is not paying attention. Right. And I also think that part of this is environmentalists in some ways have been their own worst enemy, uh, where they try to convince people, you know, in order to protect the planet, you have to do without this, you have to do without that. Uh, they criticize people who drive SUVs. They don't like people with private jets uh, flying to climate conferences. And I, I think that's just the wrong approach. I, I think you want to really think about how sustainability can be an exciting lifestyle. So. You know, I think the uh, some of the people who are manufacturing and marketing electric vehicles are showing how much better a product the electric vehicle is than the internal combustion engine. And so, you know, the Ford Lightning 150, which is the best-selling pickup truck in America, the electric version, you can't even buy. There's a huge waiting list because the electric version is so much better than the other version. So we have no reason to believe that living a sustainable lifestyle means poverty or sacrifice. In fact, it's the opposite. It can be very exciting and we can live really dynamic and exciting lifestyles uh, and also preserve the planet at the same time. You just have to pay a little more attention. Your recent book, Environmentally Sustainable Growth, if you could go back and tell yourself, give yourself some advice at the beginning when you started writing that book, what would you say to yourself? Well, I, I think I think that um, the the part of the, the current environment that uh, that I'm most concerned about is politics. You know, you have there was a story today about the governor of Georgia who is trying to attract uh, electric vehicle manufacturers and batteries, but he doesn't want to talk about climate change because uh, 
You know, climate change is a bad word. Okay. Well, I'm I'm willing to say, okay, we don't have to talk about climate change. Let's talk about modernizing our energy system. Let's talk about creating an economy uh, that is more dynamic and more cost effective than the current economy. And so if you think about pollution as waste, uh, if you don't pollute, then you are in fact more efficient. And so I, I think this idea uh, of the environment as some kind of a you know left-wing ideological idea is silly. Uh, you know, the, the largest um, environmental interest group in America is the National Wildlife Federation. Most of the people in the National Wildlife Federation are hunters or anglers. And so they've been concerned about preserving forests and streams because they use them. Uh, now, you compare that you have those folks, then you have young urban environmentalists who are vegans and you know are horrified by fur and by meat and all the rest of that. Well, okay, so we have different lifestyles. That's fine. You, let's people can live different lifestyles, but we share something in common, which which we want. We want the forests and the air and the water to be clean. So in our current politics pushes us away from each other. We have to figure out a way to pull people together toward uh, meeting these common uh, needs that we all have. I mean, everybody's got to breathe. You know, we're all biological creatures. And if you if you don't have fresh air to breathe, uh, it doesn't matter if you're, uh, you know, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, you know, they both need oxygen. So this is the point that, that I think is very important for people to understand. And I think uh, that is some, a theme that, that I developed in my book, uh, but it, it really didn't occur to me at the very beginning that it was going to become that important a theme as the book evolved. And of course, book has a limited space <laughs> and you have so much to say on the topic. What were some of the key things you wish you had space to include as well? Well, there's a lot of examples and stories uh, of, that I could have used to illustrate some of the points that I was trying to make. But I was also trying to get the book to be something people would actually read. And people's attention span these days uh, is very short. Uh, you know, kids will watch a 20 second TikTok. You know, they're not going to read a 200 page book. And so and a 200 page book is pretty short as books go. And my book is pretty short. But there are lots of examples and stories that would have uh, embellished the points. But I was trying to be uh, a little bit more succinct so people might actually get to the end of the book. So no, no key topics, but rather just some examples that you did. not Yeah. And I mean, I, I think that, that the basic concepts, you know, I mean, the book starts by looking at, you know, why is the environment in trouble? What caused these problems? And then what's our strategy to fix it? And I think the strategy has to involve some amount of regulation and rules so that there's standards, but really has to focus more on positive incentives of trying to make it possible for businesses to make money uh, making the planet cleaner. And in fact, uh, if you look at uh, you know just the economy in general and how do how does government play the most important role uh, in the economy. It's usually by pushing private and uh, positive incentives. Uh, the best example of that in America would be uh, home ownership after World War II. So before World War II, if you wanted to buy a house, uh, it was very hard to get a mortgage. And so the government invented mortgage insurance. They would actually insure the mortgage. They'd use the value of the house to insure the mortgage. They also made mortgage interest tax deductible. They made real estate taxes tax deductible. And so suddenly owning a home was as cheap as renting a home. And so we went from a nation of renters to a nation of owners. And it was public policy that did that. It also unleashed all this creative energy of sweat equity, of, of people that own their own home. And then on the weekends, they would do things to improve it. They build a garage, they build an extra room, they garden, they build a patio. And that then adds to the economic value. People didn't realize that they were certainly working 80 hours a week, 40 hours at work and 40 hours at home. 
but then they were building equity and wealth at the same time. And it was all government incentives that unleashed that. And I think the same basic philosophy is at work now, frankly, in what uh, is working in, in both in Europe and the United States in creating uh, the, this green economy. And I think we really are at, at uh, the early stages of a major transformation of how uh, our cities and how our companies are, are going to work. Such a great example. Stephen, we, we kind of mentioned it a little bit in terms of what people could do on Monday morning at 8 a.m. But to wrap up discussion about this important topic, given all that you know, what would you, maybe some, some specific things you would want people to do differently at home and at work to mm -hmm. contribute positively? I think the key thing is to pay attention. Uh, you know, we live a fast paced world. We live in a fast paced world. I mean, New Yorkers are known for it. I live in New York City and people, you know, uh, you know, they, they rush around. They, they might not throw their garbage in the garbage can. Uh, they don't think too much about uh, their resource use. Now, again, in a city like New York, where most people actually don't use motor vehicles to get around, most people take the subway or walk. Uh, or take buses or, or cabs and so forth. Uh, New York City is the most energy efficient place in America. And it, it's, and it is that way because of the infrastructure we've set up. So part of what we have to do in the rest of the country, well, the rest of the country is not going to be like New York City. We spread out. People like to have their own backyards and their own homes. So then the question is, how do we make those places as environmentally uh, sound as possible? So part of that is saving energy, part of that's installing uh, solar cells and batteries and heat pumps becoming more energy efficient. Part of it is when you're in, in your garden, you know, instead of trying to use uh, vegetation that isn't really natural in that area, uh, you know, you've seen this in the desert. Lots of people in Arizona don't have lawns anymore. They use desert uh, plants. Uh, and that saves enormous amounts of water and other kinds of, of environmental and creates less environmental damage. And part of just look at your own lifestyle and see what are the things that I can do that don't detract from my life, that maybe even add to it, uh, but where I'm paying attention to the environmental impact of what I'm doing. And I, I have to say that people are doing it more and more, and the younger people are doing it more than, than older people. Uh, my children, when they were growing up, would always criticize my use of resources and tell me that, uh, you know, they were going to inherit a, a polluted planet because of me. And so that's really, uh, you know, I think part of it is being mindful of these things. And I think people are doing that now. And the last question from my side today is, and this is not on this topic, but it's my favorite question to ask. Over the last few years, what were two, three aha moments, realizations that really change, uh, really change the way you look at life or the way you look at your work? Well, I mean, I, I think that um, the development of social media uh, has had a huge impact on how we absorb information and how we disseminate information. And I think that's had a big impact on education. Uh, I think obviously COVID-19 had, had a massive impact on everything and coming out of it, I think we're all so relieved to be back in the world again uh, and to be doing things together. I, I took a subway ride this morning and it was a crowded subway and uh, you know nobody had a mask on. And I'm thinking, you know, this is really a nice thing to see. I think the, the other thing is that uh, the growth of computing and search engines uh, and the internet itself. I mean, when I started as a scholar, I would spend hundreds of hours in libraries and in documents room, just trying to page through things to figure out you know, where I could find things. What used to take me hundreds of hours now takes me hundreds of seconds because the, compu because the computer does it for me. I mean, I still have to know whether the source is a useful source or not. And, and I understand that uh, where the data comes from. But uh, these technologies uh, have been incredibly impressive and very, very important. And I think uh, they've really made uh, many of the things that we try to do easier to do. And I think they hold tremendous potential 
for uh, for human civilization, assuming we don't blow each other up first. This is a great place to end the session. Before we do that, Steve, do you have anything else you would like to add or share? Maybe some question you wanted me to ask you and I didn't ask you. And also, where can listeners find you and learn more about you, your work, your book? Uh, well, uh, my book, Columbia University Press, is selling. It's on Amazon. It's easy to find. Um, I'm, you know, I, I write a blog every week for uh, the Earth Institute State of the Planet. And so if you want to he hear my current thoughts, they're always there. Um, and I I'm pretty accessible that way. Uh, I think the thought I would leave you with is that uh, the human species is ingenious. Uh, we constantly surprise ourselves with how inventive we are, and we're not suicidal. Uh, and the example I give of that is we've had nuclear bombs since the end of the, the World War II. We used it twice and haven't used it since. And we have plenty of crazy leaders running countries, and even they don't use them. So I think that really means we're not suicidal. And so I think that the human species will do well uh, with that creativity and with that instinct for survival. And I'm an optimist. I think that uh, that uh, the lifestyle of my children and grandchildren are going to live uh, will be even better than mine. Steve, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us and share share your thoughts with us. And for everyone listening again, our guests today have been Steve Cohen. Check out Steve's book. It is called Environmentally Sustainable Growth. Such a good title. And I will see you all next time. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me.